No. So welcome. Uh, I'm, my name is Neil Tobson. Uh, this is a, a, a intentionally slightly uh, a, a provocative uh, title. Uh, in fact, I, I already got, it's funny because I, I did a talk that had a similar title a few years ago and nobody ever said anything. I was a little surprised. Um, but I, I, I had somebody call me out a little bit earlier today about uh, thinking that nerds are commodities or something like that. And I'm like, no, I mean, it's, the intent is that, you know, sometimes you have a need for some help and how do you go about finding that? Uh, and so really, uh, my background, I'm a uh, software entrepreneur. Uh, I've done a couple of tech startups, uh, but then I've also, since I left my last, te last tech startup, I've been li living vicarious vicariously through other startups as kind of a contract CTO. So a lot of this talk kind of came out of my experiences and what I've seen in trying to help people solve this sort of problem. Uh, but really, uh, you know, obviously it's after lunch, and so I figured I'd have to, uh, to, to deal with a little bit of sleepiness. And uh, I, did, I Googled the problem really quickly. What was interesting was uh, there's all the discussion about people falling asleep in a food coma. But the other thing is, is that uh, they've, they've studied that judges uh, rule more favorably after they've had something to eat. So I'm hoping that even if you sleep through this entire presentation, you'll still enjoy it. That's the goal, right? So here's the reality if you are, and, 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 and I want to say too that, that what I'm talking about here applies, it's, it's kind of startup-y focused. It's not necessarily exclusive to that, but you'll kind of see uh, you know, the obvious uh, parallels to the startup experience or growing company, that sort of thing. And the reality is, is that most people fail on their first try. Uh, 70 percent, uh, a lot of, about, uh, the, according to the study that I found here, 10 percent, or excuse me, uh, 70% uh, fail, 12% uh, uh, succeed on their first try, 8% succeed on their second try, and 10% succeed on their third try. Uh, and so even, even out of that, these, this is uh, failure rates for entrepreneurs, not necessarily startups, I should clarify. Um, so really, um, you know, obviously this is, paints kind of a scary story, uh, and the idea here is we want to get beyond that and figure out how we can can build something successful. Uh, and so what you start out with as a non-technical person is, oh my gosh, holy cow, I have this awesome idea for dinosaurs with lasers and, uh, and, and, and volcanoes and pterodactyls and stuff like that. Uh, and then you have other people who basically say, well, you can't really do a startup without having uh, tech skills. And in California, that's considered to be true. Uh, and the reality is, is that in Minnesota, we have a little bit of a different problem from California. Because in California, there's a very strong cultural norm that you're going to have a technical co-founder. And there's a pool of technical engineering talent who is not only interested in startups, but willing to take the risk as a co-founder and so forth. And in Minnesota, that's a little bit more, well, I should say a lot more of a challenge uh, where, in my experience, there's a lot of people who, uh, it, you know, the technical talent in this town is, uh, they're either very comfortable in their uh, Fortune 500 gig or they're making great money as a freelancer. Um, and we don't, if you, kind of, if you kind of step back a second, we don't have a whole lot of experience and track record with successful startups in this town. So when you present a technical co-founder with the opportunity, they look at, you know, who do I know that's made lots of money off of helping co-found a startup, and they don't see anybody. And so I think there's a lot of factors that sort of lead to this issue of, you know, I, I want to do something here, but I don't, I don't have the skills myself to do it. I'm a business person, a salesperson, or something like that. Um, and I can't really, I struggle to find somebody to, to build stuff. So now what? Uh, these are basically your options. You can write software yourself. You can find a co-founder. You can hire an employee. You can hire a development agency. Uh, MentorMate Livefront is uh, one of our uh, signature sponsors here. Uh, you can uh, hire freelancers uh, and you can outsource it, you know, go to India, go to China, go to whatever. And I've basically been involved at some level in a startup 
with all of these different options. And they all have different pros and cons. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about what is software product development? What's the context of the conversation before we even get to evaluating different options so that we can sort of help weigh them appropriately? So the number one mistake and the place where you, know, you kind of do the little face palm is when I meet somebody who clearly feels like uh, having a software product made is sort of like going to McDonald's and ordering the quarter pounder and they say, do you want fries with that? And, and that's that to me as a, as a consultant, if, I, if, if, if that doesn't come along with some sense that I can coach you, the next step for me is run away. <laughs> but it is really, really kind of amazing how, and, and, and to some extent, you can't blame people when they have that feeling. They just, you know, a lot of times it just comes out of a, out of a place of not knowing much about software engineering. And so there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's can you alter that opinion or, or perspective on it? And so the first thing we really need to talk about and when we're evaluating all these different options is what's the difference between a project where we build something and a product, which is probably what you're talking about when you're talking about uh, some sort of a technology startup. And the first thing is, is a project is a temporary involvement or investment in results. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and then there's an end point. And a lot of times you think about this when you think about marketing websites, you think about campaign, or, you know, marketing campaigns. Sometimes you think about this in terms of e-commerce, if I'm setting up a store online or something like that. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, I can basically get it set up and operate it. Uh, but a product is not tech we use, but it's tech that we're building the company around on top of. And so if you're an e-commerce company, for example, you've probably got an e-commerce store, but that's still technology you use. What you're doing is selling goods. If you are building a product that you are then selling, and the product is the software, that's kind of that that, that, that inflection point in my mind that drives a whole sea change in shift in how you think about what you're building, who's helping you build it, how you need to uh, manage and consume what's being built, and then how you operate it after it's been built. Okay? And it's a permanent effort. This is something, you know, this is your, if you're building your product, you are trying to you know, compete in the marketplace with your product, which probably means it's, you're always going to be uh, uh, changing your sales tactics or changing the product features to try and attract more customers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Optimize things, learn things. And so it's, it's really a permanent effort and it's ongoing and constantly evolving. And it's, again, critical to your business purpose. It's not technology you use, it's technology that you are building a business on. And that's really one of the key things. The other one is innovation versus construction. The notion that in construction, think about a house. Things can go wrong in the process of building a house, but the reality is that we've been building houses for thousands of years. Uh, and we have a fairly high confidence that if I hire a general contractor, that not only do they know how to nail two boards together, but they've seen a finished house before. Right? And there's a fairly low risk of change. And you talk to construction people and they'll tell you otherwise, but compared to software, I can fairly safely say that, that the, the level of changing of your goals and your minds, and more importantly, how you're going to achieve your goals throughout the life of, of building this software product is really quite different than saying, you know, I, I like a different tile in the bathroom, okay? Whereas innovation is truly trying to do something, bringing a new product to the market that's different than anything we've seen before in some fundamental way. There's a fairly low confidence in the shared vision of outcome, which is something that a lot of non-technical business people struggle to get. I can't stress this part enough. The reality in software, if you don't have that background in software, is that uh, it is an intangible thing and you're intrinsically trying to do something that build a product that nobody's really ever quite seen before. So therefore, 
thinking that you know exactly what the end result is going to look like. Hopefully, if you're, a, you know, if you're starting this business, you have some strong opinions about what it needs to look like. But in terms of how it actually materializes as a mobile phone app or a website or something like that, what surprises a lot of first time people building technology is how things, how, how what you see as a result of the software. Um, you know, the, 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 biggest, the biggest reaction that I love is, is wow, that, that doesn't really, that, that matches what I had in my head, but it's not working the way that I thought it would. It doesn't feel like it's, it, it needs to be improved. And that happens all the time in software. So when you're doing product development, you really have to incorporate the idea that whatever you build first is probably wrong. And so that's where you get into lean startup and all this other stuff. And you can apply it to the lean startup business models and so forth as well. But in software in particular, your, you know, your first attempt is unlikely to be correct. So the first thing you do is try and figure out how to prove a hypothesis and test something, get something in front of you that you can, that you can see and, 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 and approximates what you're trying to do and evaluate whether that's useful or not. So. The other thing, when you're trying to draw analogies of what building a software product is like, you know, is it I put quarters into a vending machine and get Facebook out of it? Um, or is it like going to the moon where it was a bet the country, you know, GDP for 10 years and, uh, and, and all of a sudden we get to this, 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 this critical moment where we light the fuse and then we're on the moon? Uh, or is it, you know, a lot of times I'll actually use building architecture as uh, a, a useful analogy for building software products. Is it any of those things? It's some of those things. It's, you know, but the important thing is that it's not quite like any of these things. And about the best analogy, in fact, that I've come across is that it's more like tending a garden. You start with planting a few seeds and you see what grows and then sometimes the weeds grow with it and you clean those out. Uh, producing a technology product is really a lot more like growing and tending a garden than it is like building a house. Sometimes you find out the weeds are the product you needed. Sometimes you find out the weeds are the product you needed. That happened, I met the, one of the founders of YouTube. That started out as a dating site. You know, you and be us right now. I am, now it's, it's true. It, and you can actually verify that. But, but it actually started out as a dating site. And what they found was that the videos people were posting were not at all what they expected. And eventually they decided, well, we, we built this video platform and people are using it in ways that we totally never intended. Uh, let's just let them tell us how they want to use this video platform. And now we have YouTube. Okay, so take yeah. <laughs> well, there was no money in it at this point. Oh, yeah. That's the funny thing. But yeah, if you find that there's a need, and hopefully that need involves money. Obviously, it's not really a business without money. But, but sometimes before you can get to the money, you need to uncover the need. But that's really, a, a, you know, so, so hopefully we're painting a picture here that software product development isn't quite like most other industries where you can sort of say, hey, you know, uh, my toilet's broken, call a plumber, they can fix it, you know, or something like that. It's, it's a little more nuanced than that. And, and I like the garden tending uh, analogy because it really, um, it also evokes images of, of uh, being patient and letting things grow and deciding then if you like it or not and pruning and that sort of thing. Uh, and so that, that analogy I found very useful. The other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that it's a lot more than the code. A lot of people say, I need somebody to write me some JavaScript or some PHP or a mobile app or something like that. And if you're building, you know, if you've got a, 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 your, your family-owned laundromat on the corner and you're building the marketing website for that, you might be able to come up with, you know, that project that, you know, you launch that website and it's done. When you're dealing with a product, you have to think about all of the things that go along with uh, operating that product. And so there's all these different vectors. So you've got the development process, which because this isn't a project, because this isn't something we're doing once, we probably want to have some sort of uh, hopefully efficient, at least predictable process of deciding uh, uh, how to actually build the thing because we're going to be doing this forever, right? 
And the next one is the engineering aspect. That's the part that everybody talks about of what tools are we using, what languages and all that other stuff. But if you're not a technical person, you still have the risk factor of not knowing whether those tools are the relevant or best tools for what you're trying to accomplish. There's the design and architecture. That's the other one that people sort of get, at least in the design side of like, does it, do, does it uh, uh, look nice and, and, and does it uh, feel the way that I want it to feel? But there's also the design aspects in terms of, are we building something in a way that allows it to uh, realize its full potential over time? Or are we, uh, and that applies to both what you see in the software, but also the code underneath because that's where my building architecture comes in. It's like if I'm building a, a if, I, if I said uh, the requirement is I need to house a family of four and I stop there and I don't think about anything else, I could come, you know, the, the software engineer might come back with a single family home. It might come back with half a duplex. It might come back with the, the, the um, the foundation of a 20-story apartment building with one unit finished, or all units finished, most expensive four-person four home I've ever seen, or they might come back with a, uh, a travel trailer and a diesel pickup truck to pull it. Those would all meet the requirements, right? But which one is the right architecture for where your business is going? Um, you get into product management, which is how you figure out that you're building the right thing. Obviously, in the business side, that involves talking to customers, that involves uh, uh, subject matter expertise and all those things that you can envision, but it impacts the technology too because there's a lot of things you can do these days to, for example, instrument your product to find out how people are engaging with it. You know, are they clicking this button or that button? How many clicks does it take to get something done? Can you get any clues out of what the you know, product is actually seeing? And in software, there's a lot of ways to actually go get good data out of the product to help you with understanding what the product should do next. And so that goes from being what's traditionally a business problem to now actually where there's definitely technical implications on that. Um, but then we go into the quality. You know, what trade-offs are we making? Speed versus time versus quality. Uh, or reliability, accuracy, whatever metrics of quality you want. And there's operations. How do we deploy and operate it reliably? What happens if it's down? Who gets notified when it's down? What do we do when they get notified? Uh, what kinds of disasters are we equipped to handle? What kinds of disasters do we say, well, that was a nice run, <laughs> and it's over now? Um, all those sorts of things. Security is another one. You know, what happens if a bad person wants to do bad things? And intellectual property, what's your secret sauce? Do you need to have something in place to protect that? All of those kinds of things are all technology-oriented topics that really have nothing to do with hiring somebody who knows PHP. <laughs> and those are all the things that when I see people who don't get past hiring somebody for PHP, then they'll generally fail on at least one of these axes, one of these vectors. Um, you know, the, the coders in the room will, will chuckle when I said earlier this week, I saw a 20, or excuse me, 47,000 line JavaScript file. That was, that was my Tuesday, right? And, 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 and it was a case, and th the crazy part about it all is that this product is on the market, it's generating revenue, it, it actually works quite well, except that now the company has discovered that this is a problem because they've, they've been trying to get the product to do more things, and they had no idea that they were sacrificing a particular aspect of quality in exchange for some really cheap labor. A, a really common version of that is also people who don't make security in early. Uh, mm -hmm. The InfoSec Twitter sphere is like funny because Web, but that's a huge deal of like, yep. oh, and now let's add some security to it. <laughs> right. What? Yep. The other big thing I've seen is you get a website and you don't factor in the metrics. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is business comes later and says they want to bolt on X, Y, and Z. And now they're taking your code and they want to insert all this Google Analytics stuff and the developers are going, what the hell are you doing? And right. You know, then they find out that this button is really designed to capture that code right. the way you want. To right. 
And extensibility is a whole other aspect. That's really where you get into the design and architecture piece of it, where what, what trade-offs are you making between building for the future versus getting what you need today? And obviously, as a startup, a lot of times, you really don't want, you don't have the money to think about what's coming a year down the line. But if you don't have any idea of what you're sacrificing and where in that process, then you know, that you're just taking on a huge amount of risk because uh, I like to say that every, every line of code that somebody writes on your behalf is placing a bet on your behalf because every line of code has built-in assumptions about what it needs to achieve. And if your engineers, if you're hiring engineers and have no connection between somehow imbuing your business and your vision into that code, then the bets that that line of code are placing are probably in some other direction from the bets that you're placing as the CEO of the business. And when you need to pivot and you find out your technology is over here, then you've got to deal with the cost of pivoting the technology to match where the business has gone. And that can be a huge, huge, it can be an existential threat to the business. And so that's really what we're talking about. And you can't completely mitigate all of these risks. You know, stuff still happens. But the idea is, can we come up with some way of at least understanding where the risks are and which risks we're taking as a business? Because that'll just increase our chances of success. So what do we do about all this now? Is we need to figure out some way of building an understanding of the needs and the risks and the capabilities across these vectors and then find people and mechanisms to fill the gaps as best as we can. Especially in a startup, you don't have time for perfection. You don't have the resources for perfection. But anything you can do along this path to improve your chances just takes a few more things away from the, list, the, the million line list of ways that you can fail. And then the other thing, of course, is always try and find ways of measuring results. So seriously, <laughs> now what? Do we do the DIY, the co-founder, et cetera? And the big thing here is I am stereotyping here. I'm going to tell you this right now. Like I said, I've, I have uh, personally been involved in all of these in at least one iteration along the way. And I've certainly seen where many of the stereotypes that I'm about to describe were not true in that case, okay? But what I'm trying to do is say, here's some things to think about if you wanna go down this path versus that path, okay? So the first one's DIY. Build it yourself. That's the cheapest. You have total control over the results. The downsides are time, obviously. Quality, if you're not already a, a, a proficient uh, software engineer. So what do we do about it if we go that route? Well, obviously the ideal scenario is you're already a programmer so that you can deal with the quality sides of things. You can learn to program. I actually have some friends who did this. Uh, they built their MVP in their basement, uh, taught themselves how to code along the way, and managed to make some very large enterprise sales on the MVP, raise some money because of that, and then turned around and said, oh God, now we gotta actually, but they were, they were aware of, the, of what they were doing, and so when they landed their big customer and their funding, they knew that the next thing they needed to do was go hire some experienced software people, and they told those people when they went there, hey, we built this in our basement, so you know, just so you know what you're inheriting, we need you to help us take it to the next step, whatever that is. And we understand that what we've built is probably not super robust because we're not software engineers, right? And so they, it was a case where they made a very calculated risk here and, uh, and, and made a decision and it paid off for them in a big way. But they did it with the right perspective. And that's what all of these options are about is what is the perspectives that I might have if I go that route. Can I argue on the other side of the quality? Sure. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Over engineering at, at any stage in a company is a bad idea. 
when you're trying to get a startup off the ground. I would say over-engineering an MVP is probably less of a problem because you probably haven't, uh, you probably don't have any customers yet, you probably don't have any funding yet, and so really you're just wasting your time. So I would actually say over-engineering after you get funding and customers is actually bigger risk. But nonetheless, over-engineering is never really a good thing. You always want to build the minimum thing you can build to test the next step of your business. Can I get more customers to sign up? Can I get those kinds of customers to sign up, et cetera? Driving behavior, whatever that is. But then the next one, obviously, is should I just hold out for a co-founder? Should I just you know, beat the odds in Minnesota anyway and find a co-founder? So that is obviously the maximum. The, one of the things you want to look for with whoever is building software is what's their incentive to, to think about your business as they're building it so that when they're writing those lines of code and placing those bets on your behalf, that they're more likely to be good bets or at least in line with what you're doing as the CEO or the business leader. And so having a co-founder is the best way to ensure that they're incentivized, right? It's also cheap from a cash perspective because presumably they're gonna do it for equity, not necessarily, but hopefully they're probably not gonna get market rate anyway. Um, the downsides are they're tough to find in Minnesota especially on equity. Uh, software engineers are in demand. We have, a, a people call it the cabin culture, where a lot of people really just like working their nine to five job and go to the cabin on the weekend. Um, and, if the, and if they're of a startup mindset, the problem is you can make a lot of money as a freelancer without necessarily having to take the risk. And like we talked about before, there haven't been a lot of big exits in Minnesota. So when they look around and they evaluate your opportunity, they don't see friends who've made millions of dollars by investing in a startup. Um, so. They're tough to find. The d other downsides is, is that you become married to this person. And it really is very much like getting married. Um, you're very tightly coupled to that person. And so it's tough to change who they are or what they're good at. Um, but what you can do about it, find somebody you trust. Find somebody who matches your philosophies in terms of what you want the business to be down the road and what role they want to play in it. Um, but you also want somebody who's kind of agnostic about technology because if you need to pivot the business and that means that we need to change the technology we're using, do you have to go find a new co-founder now because they know PHP and now you're going to go do Node.js or something like that? You know, so, so finding somebody who understands what the potential turns are. Uh, and then, of course, having your prenuptial agreement, you know, having your co-founder agreement. Uh, and then the biggest thing is regular communication about equity and roles and commitment. And that's one of those things where I had this conversation with somebody the other day. You can have some great uh, agreements in place, but if it's been a year and you haven't talked about it and then something goes sideways, you haven't exercised the muscle of talking about how we work together as co-founders. And uh, I'm relying on this level of commitment from you and have these expectations and vice versa. And if you don't have that kind of conversation on a regular basis, it kind of doesn't matter what the contract says. Contracts are just there so that the lawyers can sort out who wins when you can't fix a problem yourself. Um, the next step here is the one that a lot of people end up doing in this town, which is hiring a development agency, live front, Mentormate, the nerdery, all these sorts of things. They're easy to find. There's fairly low friction to get started with them. They're eager to get going and build you something. Uh, and, there, and a lot of times there's no experience necessary in, in the sense that they have resources to help you figure out what you want to build, at least the good ones do. And so they'll be a little better about pulling requirements out and those sorts of things. But the downsides are that they're typically the most expensive option. And they probably have the highest misalignment on incentives. And that's where you see things get really tripped up, is you know, sales guy for company X wants the business. You've got the money to pay them. And so of course they say, yeah, we can totally do that for you. Maybe they've never done it before. Maybe the guy who wrote that code uh, went to work for some other company and now they effectively don't know how to do that anymore. You really have no idea. And so that's really where I see things go wrong is because of this incentive misalignment where uh, the companies aren't able to deliver 
in a way that matches what you need as a business um, because they're making decisions that suit their business first. And you may also have fairly little visibility into the sausage making. Some of the agencies are better than others at this, but a lot of times you don't have super direct control over how they do their project management and their quality control and things like that. So like an example of something that I've seen before was um, where uh, a feature was built and it, and it worked beautifully. And we found out later that the reason it worked beautifully was because the software engineer wrote a whole bunch of junk, but they have a great QA process. So it went to QA, QA sent it back because it didn't work. And then the software engineer wrote more junk and sent it to QA, and QA sent it back. And by the way, we're paying for every bounce of the ping pong ball here, right? And so ultimately, yes, the software was great, but the cost was like this, and we had no visibility until we really started poking into as to why this feature cost this much. And it turned out it was because there was this misalignment in incentives and you know, it was not in their best interest to explain what their process was or to let us see into how they were building the product. Neil, mm -hmm. would you say that's different between outsourcing and dev agencies? I've, I've only worked with outsourcers. Nope. No, in fact, it's worse than outsourcing, and that's, that's a couple slides down. Yeah. <laughs> our, our experience is different because we told them you're checking into our tree. Yep. Um, you know, we're getting regular updates. Yep. So in that scenario, and this is one, um, this is a scenario that uh, um, I've had some very good success with, is how do you mitigate that, right? One way you mitigate this risk is to take more ownership of all of the other vectors that we talked about a couple slides back, where that, so to w some extent that reduces them to just doing the code. And then you're taking responsibility for ensuring the process management, the product management, the, the quality, et cetera, and forcing them to just focus on writing the code. But that requires expertise in all those areas. So you were using, because Mark, I know you're a software nerd, you were using your background there to mitigate those problems in this scenario. And so yeah, that's a totally valid way to do that. I mean, that's, that's kind of part of what I do in my consulting work, is help mitigate those risks. But, so there's different ways to do that, but that is what you gotta watch out for. Um, and that, oh, by the way, the other, the other part of the highly mis misaligned incentives is that a lot of these companies are really geared towards project work. A lot of them um, have straight up background in building marketing websites rather than products, but even the ones that do you know, the more meaty software engineering, because of the way that their business operates, they really try to put everything in, you know, the, the, the square peg into the round hole of a project, when what you need is a product. And there's lots of good reasons why they need to operate that way, but it does create a misalignment again. And so it's not like it's the end of the world, but it's something you need to be aware of, is that these people want a statement of work that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, an acceptance criteria, and then we hand over the keys to what we built, and there you go, it's yours now. And that's, that's kind of tough to do when you've got a living, breathing thing. It's like, it's like the, uh, it's, it, you know, it'd be kind of like, uh, 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 you know, having a baby and then handing it off to somebody and saying, hey, it's done. And, you know, wait, this, this thing needs care and feeding and, and nurturing and, and, and additional investment into it to become a, a, a well-functioning adult in society, right? Um, and so when you try and fit everything into that project box, um, that becomes a little bit, you have to think about what that means. Yep. Exactly. Uh -huh. Absolutely, and, and and that's that. No matter what, there's I, I'm you know there's always a risk of things going badly. No matter how much talent you've got, right? Yep. There can be. Yep. 
but in that case, you've got to find somebody who uh, can mitigate those factors for you. And so do you, do you figure out a way to do it yourself? Or do you figure out, um, do, you figure, do you bring in a third party to help manage that? Um, so uh, going back to the freelancers here. So a freelancer is, is, yes, it is pay for code. But in my experience anyway, freelancers have a somewhat different way of looking at the world because they're not, um, the, the way that they run their business has some kind of fundamentally different drivers from the way that you know, the nerdery or, or mentor mate or somebody runs their business. And so the good news is that they can be amazing talent because generally speaking, if this person is able to write, uh, 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 if this person is able to maintain their own uh, book of work and keep themselves busy without the oversight of a bigger business machine behind them, they're probably pretty awesome at building stuff, right? It's not a given, but the chances are higher. They also tend to be, have very high levels of engagement. In other words, they're interested in your business. A lot of these freelancers can, to some extent, pick and choose their work. So they work with people they like, they work on projects that they like, and part of the reason that they're still freelancers is that they like having a deeper connection with their clients. And so they're more likely, at least, not guaranteed, but more likely to be interested in helping you make your business successful rather than writing some code and getting paid for it. Those are two very different things. And then the, you know, that, so that goes into the third one there of being able to do the strong relationships. The downsides, they can be relatively expensive. Sometimes the same, but usually a little cheaper, but still pretty expensive relative to the dev agency scenario. Um, quality for dollar, they're probably a bit higher just because they do tend to be a little bit more rock star-ish because the freelancers are able to survive that way. Um, but the other downside is that you can get into a herding cat scenario because a lot of times no one person has all of the expertise you need. So you end up hiring multiple of them. And then that, that involves a certain amount of work as well of you know, finding another freelancer who knows something different and figuring out how they work together and managing that. Whereas the, the, the development agency will be like, yeah, we got a guy in the back that can do that too. And they'll handle that for you. Um, and then again, you still have misaligned incentives. Fundamentally, it's not your business isn't their business. Um, like I said, tend to be a little better on that front with the freelancers just from a personality perspective, but still. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned earlier too uh, on, the, on the other slide about hourly billing. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later, but hourly billing is still usually a good thing. Um, and, it, and, and the other thing about freelancers is that because you're dealing with one personality, um, you know, it's not, sometimes with a development agency, if you have somebody working on your project that isn't working out, they'll have somebody else that they can shift things to or whatever. You have to be a little more careful with the freelancers in the sense that it requires more nuance in understanding what their strengths and weaknesses are and being a little more open and sensitive to that. Um, and so what do you do there? You f the biggest thing you can do there is find freelancers who have experience dealing with your kind of gig. Is it a startup? Is it a small company? Is it a tech company? Is it a nonprofit? Uh, what's the business model? What's the industry, et cetera? And the more you can align that, free, you know, that freelancer's background with what you're doing, the more they're going to be able to help you grow your business rather than just write code. Um, and then understanding what they're good at and adapt. Sometimes you hire somebody, a freelancer. I've hired a freelancer who I knew up front that they were just not going to understand what we're trying to accomplish, but I knew they were amazing at writing code. And so I had to spend extra attention to understand how to communicate with them of what we needed. And then develop metrics around how you can measure their success. And then the offshore, you know, similar to the dev agency, except that it's super inexpensive. Lowest friction to start and stop. The, the, literally, offshore can be like a fifth of the cost of a freelancer. Um, and so it's, you know, massive, massive savings in cost. But they tend to be slower. They tend to have lower quality. And you often have even less visibility into their processes. A lot of offshore places, not all of them, but a lot of them will want to pay you on delivery of the thing. And so you don't get to see much of anything in between. Um, or they'll give you access to test it, but you don't get the intellectual property until it's all said and done. And so that's something that you can negotiate sometimes too, uh, if you have the ability to manage it a little more, a little more closely. Um, 
uh, definitely requires the heaviest direct management and oversight. They have the least aligned incentives to understand your business. They tend to be much more, um, it's not a universal truth because I've worked with some offshore teams that were fantastic, but they, they do as a general rule tend to very much want you to very specifically specify exactly what you want and they will go write code that matches that and give it to you. And that's the end of our relationship. You pay me for that and we're done. And they really don't want to know anything about you know, uh, your future vision or anything like that. And so you're likely to sacrifice a lot on those. Remember, we were talking about every line of code is a bet. You're, willing, you're probably going to be sacrificing a fair bit on that front. There's another dynamic at work, though, is that they want your next job, too. That's true. And, and so often they will try to sign you up, you know, a couple months before the end of the job, saying, we can keep these people who now know your, yep. your environment, your technology, if you, if you sign up now. That's yep. not the case. That's one thing to understand about a lot of these companies is they have very high turnover on the back end. Right. That means that's you're not getting SMEs that know your product. You're getting the guy who's currently working there. You can spend a lot of time, and I've seen a lot of companies and 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 the the churn is a problem no matter what right anybody can leave but right And I, I want to say that I agree with 100% with both of you, right? And this is like, like I'm saying, these are stereotypes. It's something that you have to watch out for very closely when dealing with offshore teams. I've seen cases where um, the two things that I watch out for a lot is one, um, a lot of times they'll assign a project manager to you. Many, many times that project manager is really nothing more than a translator from English to whatever the local language is, you know, Hindi or whatever. And, 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 and so are they actually a project manager? Are they adding value to this equation or are they just translating? In which case I have to be super careful because there's the loss in translation, you know? Um, and the other problem is, is that when you have a language barrier, it becomes, uh, a lot of these offshore teams that I've dealt with, um, or at least the, 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 the ones that I, that, that I I, I am inclined to not deal with are the ones that really hide how the software is made on the back end because I've actually been in situations where you know we had our project manager uh, uh, who was kind of the translator and then we had Sam who was the engineer and you know we never talked directly to Sam because he didn't speak English well it turns out Sam was a pseudonym for somebody who was on the other end writing code and it was actually a different person every other month. And they shared an email address and they probably churned as employees or something like that. And so you didn't have an actual resource there. There was no uh, subject matter knowledge being built. And you know, you, we only found this out because there was zero progress on the project because somebody new was learning our code every other week, right? So that's the sort of stuff you gotta watch out for with the offshore. And I think we're almost done. No matter what, I don't care which option you pick. Almost all of these uh, 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 things to watch out for can be solved with trust and communication. But you know, what's the nature of the communication? What are you watching out for? And no matter what, it is in your best benefit to learn more about this art of software engineering. Right? If you if you uh, understand that counting the lines of code produced is not a good useful metric for measuring quality, that is to your benefit. But if you understand what a pull request is, so, so uh, I was working with somebody recently who uh, she had taken it upon herself to get logged into Bitbucket, and she's like, I don't know how to read this stuff, but I've learned that I can sort of, uh, I, can, I can have a BS meter 
on what the engineer is telling me based on what I see in the pull request. And I don't know what the code is, but if they say it was an easy change and there's a whole bunch of code change, I know to start asking questions. Or if they build me this many hours and it was two lines of code, I know to start asking questions. And maybe the answer is it was a really hard problem and it took us forever to find those two lines of code. Or maybe it was, no, I didn't actually work that much yesterday and I, I actually uh, uh, made a mistake in logging the work, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Um, but but the, again, the more you learn about the art of software engineering, uh, the more that you can uh, start to understand how to work with people better. Um, and the results are going to be proportional to your level of engagement. Um, you're unlikely to be successful if you treat this like ordering a quarter pounder at McDonald's. Um, and so you can devise in a lot of ways to align incentives through different agreements. Um, and the other big key advice is beware of, of uh, absolutes. If somebody is fixed bidding a project and it's not a simple website, that's a, like, I'm not saying don't ever do that. I'm saying that should make flags go up that you need to test very carefully because it's actually even, even if, think about it this way, if I am somebody and I bid to you uh, uh, $100 to build this thing and it actually ends up costing $200 but I fix bid it so I can't bill you more, when we get to the second half of that project, it's one thing to say that I, I took on that, that, that risk and I, I took the bet that that software is going to take this long to get done. But is it any benefit to you that my next reaction is to get this thing out the door and done as fast as possible? Like, think about it. All quality goes out the window. All of caring about what you're trying to achieve as a business goes out the window, all because I made a mistake in, in estimating and you're holding me to it. So now it's just get out as quickly and cheaply as I can, get the work done, w and, and make whatever compromises are made, made, needed to be made to meet the requirements. Um, so there's lots of different things to watch out for there. Um, you can talk about equity and profit sharing and those sorts of things, but that could go on a whole nother conversation. Um, and then we have some nerd psychological disorders. Um, not invented here syndrome is one of my favorites. If I didn't build it, so I came into a project and I didn't write the code that was there before, it therefore sucks, no matter how bad it is or good it is. Shiny hammer syndrome is that, you know, I know how to use that tool and so I'm gonna use that particular language, library, whatever, to do everything else, whether that's the right decision or not. Um, not my job, uh, a few others to watch out for, mostly, mostly relatively fun stuff, but I think we're out of time. Cool. I'm also looking at Martin here. We don't have a presenter. <laughs> Thank you.